Council. Phil Rogers, who has been covering this story for NBC5 News and is an expert in reporting on aviation. And Rob Mark, a commercial pilot and publisher of JetWine, that's spelled J-E-T-W-H-I-N-E dot -E com. Before becoming a pilot in the late 80s, he spent 10 years as an FAA tower and radar controller around Chicago. We extended invitations to the FAA, to the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, and the Chicago Aviation Commissioner. All of them turned us down. Welcome to Chicago tonight. Thank you. Rob, Mark, let me start with you. Just describe for us, if you will, what Aurora Air Traffic Control does and why it matters. Well, air traffic control at the center uh, handles what we call the en route traffic, and it's usually the airplanes that uh, have departed uh, from any of the local airports and are up through maybe 10,000 feet and up into the high altitude structure, up as high as 50,000 feet. And the same thing coming down. They kind of funnel them into the major uh, Chicago airports, and then once they get down to the 10, 12,000 feet in the descent, they turn them over to O'Hare and then they guide them to the runway. So Phil, what exactly happened on Friday? You had this gentleman, he went in at about 5.06, that's when they showed that he used his key card to get into the building. He got into an area where he had been working on a daily basis because he was a contract employee for Harris Electronics, which is working with a big contract for the FAA. He got in there and started fires in numerous locations, and then when the fire department arrived, they found him on the floor having already injured himself and attempting to slash his own throat. The problem is, is that he knew the infrastructure very intimately. It was what he worked on, if you will. He knew how to fix it, so thus he knew how to damage it as well. What seems unbelievable, Deborah Hurstman, is the fact that, as we understand it, the system sat right beside the backup system, so they both went down. Nobody really plans to put a backup system on top of a system, do they? Well, you know, I think there are a lot of questions here about redundancy, and it's about equipment redundancy, but also the human beings, too, and what equipment that they are trained to operate on, what they're familiar with. And now what we have is a situation where many of these en route controllers have been dispersed out to other neighboring facilities. This facility actually controlled that high altitude traffic for, for about five state area. So it's really important to be able to have that continuity of operations. They're struggling right now. They clearly are, but this could have been, correct me if I'm wrong, a catastrophe. Is that right? It, it could have been a lot worse if the weather had been worse. I think we would have seen the delays uh, compound pretty quickly. Uh, and, and that has been the only saving grace uh, in addition to the, the controllers that were there to try to pick up the load in, in the other locations, as, as, as Deb said. I mean, that, that's so important that we realize that they're not trained. I, I should say they're, they're trained to deal when the primary system goes down, you go to the backup. But when they both go down, that's probably not something they had a whole lot of uh, preparation for. And I think they did a pretty darn good job over the last few days. Because nobody was killed or injured. No, and the, the controllers are doing an amazing job right now. They're being sent into places where they don't normally work. They, they, there's no playbook for this. But one of them pointed out something really, really important to me today, and that was, yes, this was an act of sabotage, but this just as easily could have been a, a, an accidental fire. It could have been a tornado. It could have been something else that took out Chicago Center. The bottom line is, what did they learn out of this? They learned that they've got this this, you know, here's one, here's one, here's one, and you take one out, and this one can't pick up the duties of the other one. And, and that's a, if you will, it's a flaw in the way the system is set up. Um, understand the flight plans burned up for all of the airline flights that are handled out of Chicago. So as a result, all of those are being entered now manually by good pilots like this one, and then all that has to be read back and everything. It's a really time-consuming process. We went through 9-11, and before 9-11, we would later learn there had been plenty of concerns about the fragility or the vulnerability of this system. What part did we not understand enough to fortify the system in the last three years? You know, I think that's a great question because when we look at the system and how interconnected it is, and we see just one facility going down in the country and the ripple effects that that has across the whole nation, and you really understand how, how extremely fragile and dependent the system is, 
But when you think about it, this is a system that is based on World War II era technology. This is ground radar. All of us walking around in our pockets or our purses, we have satellite-based communications with our GPS that's in our phones. If we want to move to a much more redundant, much more robust system, we have got to accelerate and support the path that's underway to move them to satellite-based control, not ground-based control, because we continue to be vulnerable with systems like this. But haven't we had those conversations? I mean, is this a, is, is this a new conversation? No, I don't think it is. I, I mean, the, the, uh, over the weekend, uh, the, the Department of Transportation's Inspector General uh, put out a report that was very critical of, of FAA leadership uh, in the sense of, of getting this new uh, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, ADSB we call it, system up and running. They've had it uh, in the plan for a long time, and everybody that's on the operational side, aviation-wise, says, you know what, we're, we're putting all this equipment in, FAA, how are we going to use it? How are you going to use this information? And FAA is not ready for that, and, and they don't seem to have much of an answer of exactly when they will be ready for that, and that's why everybody's just kind of wondering what else they're doing. One of the ironies here is that he was in the building working on new technology. This, this, this massive multi-billion dollar effort to modernize the FAA. He was one of the contract people that was doing that. And remember, he had been working in the building for nine years. And do we know anything about his background in terms of whether he went through any profiles? We know there was a warning on Facebook, right? Well, and it's interesting you should mention that because as we reported tonight at six o'clock, uh, going back to 1998, the GAO has been warning that security was not good enough in these facilities, especially for contract employees. We're uh, seeing the, the courtroom sketches here. He obviously didn't, I mean, he's, he's well enough now to stand before a judge. You know, Carol, there was a suggestion, and, and I don't know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hardly an expert on security or much of anything else, but I mean, I would, I would we, we spoke to one controller today who was saying, you know, in a missile silo, you never let one guy be in there by himself. You know, there's always somebody in, they are, they're always at least in pairs. And he was asking, why would you have a person who doesn't work for the agency in the mo one of the most sensitive areas and allow him to be in there by himself? I think that's one of the things they're going to start looking at. Is there an issue between a contractor and a full-time employee here? I mean, is, is there an area to be explored on this? Well, I would say that, you know, when we look at this situation, obviously, it's unique to this individual, but workplace violence across the board is a huge issue in workplaces all across the country. And so this person was trying to do harm to themselves, but I would say we all have challenges when we look at how to manage our own workforce, what risks are present, whether you have one person on duty alone. But I think the other issue too is to look back and say, when we say we're looking for redundancy in a system, what are we talking about? Are we talking about emergency? backup, you know, redundancy? Are we talking about 100% operation? Because if anything were to happen to this studio, could you, you know, replicate what you have here 100%? I'm not sure it's reasonable to expect that the FAA or any other work mm -hmm. site or operation can replicate 100% if their main site goes down. But it does raise the question of what's the difference between a terrorist and a saboteur? Semantics. I mean, really, I mean, if, if they think that people weren't terrorized on Friday when they found out that an employee had done something or even a contractor had done something to interrupt the air traffic control system for people that were going to fly, uh, I, I bet there were an awful lot of frightened people. I is mean, luckily it didn't turn out to be quite that bad. Is the FAA proactive or reactive as a normal course of things? I She's think, the expert on I think this. Deborah, I think, Deborah, you would know the answer to that. You know, I would say the FAA has a really difficult job to do, and so just prefacing that, um, they also have financing and funding challenges. They aren't necessarily uh, treated like a business. When the sequester went into effect last year, the across-the-board cuts to the government, they took a hit. And so I think some of the questions that people have to ask is, are we going to be satisfied to get what we pay for? And some of this, some of this infrastructure I think there's been a desire absolutely to accelerate the implementation. The question is, have the dollars been there uh, over time, and can they count on that year to year to year without having interruptions? And so it is tough to implement these long-term infrastructure projects, and we have to, as a nation, prioritize them because the delays like we saw.